Amen. Amen. Good to see you this morning. Uh, would you open your Bibles, please, to uh, the book of Second Peter? The letter of Second Peter will be in, in chapter two again, finishing up chapter two uh, today. Um, and uh, in many ways, this is part two of our message last week. Pastor Brandon did a wonderful job in leading us through the first half of chapter two, and we'll be seeking to unpack the second half of chapter two. Um, the entire chapter of Second Peter is a sobering detail of um, a few main things. It's an unpacking of a sobering detail as to the deception, the devastation, and the ultimate destruction that will come upon uh, false teachers. That's what chapter 2 in Second Peter is about. It's detailing, quite graphically, the deception, the devastation, and the ultimate destruction that will come upon false teachers. So that's how we begin our Advent season. So Merry Christmas. There you go. All right? Merry Christmas. Um, but we are in God's Word, and one of the things we do as we preach God's, words, uh, God's Word, again, in expository preaching, we go verse by verse, and this is where we are today. And so we both are aware of the sobriety of a message like this today and last week, but we're also aware of the authority of God's Word and the need for God's Word in our lives um, as well. The sobering wickedness of false teachers is this, is that they long to see others destroyed with them. Um, they are trying to bring people down a path of destruction, whether they are fully conscious of that or not. You think of someone who longs to bring people with them destruction. Who does that remind you of? Uh, it reminds you of Satan. This is, this is Satan's greatest goal. Uh, in John 10, Jesus says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy uh, that is what Satan desires to do. See, Satan specializes in the counterfeit. And Satan wants to counterfeit. Again, he presents it looks like truth, but it's not. He wants to deceive. And the reason he wants to deceive is because he ultimately wants to destroy. So one of the great tactics that Satan uses over the course of history in his deception is to employ false teachers. That's what Satan does. He employs false teachers to gather people away from the light, away from Christ, away from the truth, because in the end, again, like there's not, it's not like Satan is like 98% bad and evil and 2% good. He's 100% pure evil. Every, you always got to remember that. Like, so whatever he represents, man, they're like, there's, there's not a part, oh, that's not bad. No, 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 it's all bad. It's all evil. It's all very serious. It's all very grievous. So what we need to know as we go through, again, Second Peter, and by the way, I want you to understand this too. One of the reasons we are in this epistle, the letter of Second Peter, is because we want to be in chapter 2. Uh, chapter 2 speaks powerfully to our day today. It's a tough chapter. Again, it's graphic today. It's sobering last week and this week, but it's a needed word. It brings great detail as to the devastation that we currently face. It's always amazing to me, this word written like basically 2,000 years ago, and here we are today, and how relevant it is because God wrote it. And God knows exactly what we need as his people and as the church. So we are seeking to discern in our day with truth and wisdom. To discern what? Deception. To discern the dishonesty. To discern the destruction that is trying to come upon us and lead us to discern the darkness that is around us. It's very, very, very important that we grow in wisdom and maturity in that sense. Um, I, a couple of weeks ago, I told you that I was in Ottawa in the last month, and I was meeting with some uh, believing MPs on Parliament Hill, and I was so amazed. The one particular group that we met with, I think I mentioned this, is that to a person, each one of them said as the greatest thing they're sensing is the reality of spiritual darkness, again, in our nation's capital. Um, that, that was profound to me. Uh, that sobered me. Uh, in some ways, I was emotional as well. You have, again, believing Christ-following politicians there, and the single greatest thing that they want us to know is the reality of darkness that is so present in our day, at least where they find themselves. Wow. Um, because in the end, it's a battle between good and evil. That's what's happening around us, and this is exactly what we need to be reminded of. So again, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 10. Take a look now. Um, very, very serious stuff and a lot of description here in our text today. We'll start with the first few verses. Uh, verse 10, describing the false teachers, uh, they are bold and willful. They do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment, a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. Verse 12, but these... 
false teachers, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, wow, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant. They don't know what they're talking about. Uh, They will also be destroyed in their destruction. Not my words, God's word. Suffering wrong as they wage for their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed. Wow. And Peter almost can't take it anymore. He just says and pronounces, a cursed children, exclamation mark. Forsaken the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing. Verse 16, but he was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with a human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. Let's just stop right there. Can I just say, okay, wow, okay? Uh, A lot, a lot there. Uh, A lot of detail and a lot of truth that is very sobering for us. Uh, A tough, tough text this week again. Tough text last week. Tough text this week Uh, Uh, battling it out in my study in some ways, just begging the Lord for clarity, understanding insight and application for us right now. Again, there's a seriousness like there needs to be. I certainly feel it this weekend, and I pray that you will rightly uh, as well. So we start here today. uh, We're unpacking uh, the devastating corruption of false teachers. The devastating corruption of false teachers. We learn this about false teachers. Number one, uh, they revel in wickedness and wrongdoing. False teachers love, love, love wickedness and wrongdoing. It's what they live for. They revel in it. This is what God's word is telling us today. So as we jump into our text today, I want you to remind us of our, I want you to remind again you of our series title. It's beside me, behind me here. It's, again, it's character corruption and the second coming. This is essentially outlining Peter's epistle in chapter 1, 2, and 3. And the reason this is so important here to remind us again today is that every healthy ministry will be aware of all three. Every healthy ministry is aware of the divine power of God and the truth of God pointing to us to grow in the character of God. And churches must emphasize that reality. But you can't just stop there. Every healthy ministry will also focus on the reality of 2 Peter chapter 2, which is a strong, strong vigilance against the enemies coming against God. We'll be aware, and it's so important for messages like today, to be vigilant and on guard against the false teachers, against the attack on the truth. This is one of Satan's greatest methods. And then finally in chapter 3, every healthy ministry will also anticipate the coming victory of God. We're excited to be there in the coming weeks, Lord willing. Some churches just want to focus on the essence of growing in character, but that's not enough. That's good, not enough. Some churches just want to be kind of aggressively going after false teachers. That's good, it's not enough. Some churches, again, again, seek the balance of having all three happening here, which is what we desire to be as well. Want to grow in Christ, want to be vigilant against errors and false teachers, and we want to ultimately proclaim the victory of God. That's what a healthy ministry does. This is being exemplified for us here in 2 Peter 1, 2, and 3. But in chapter 2 now, which again obviously is where we are, Peter takes a deep dive as to the intentions and the threats of false teachers. Uh, He emphasizes the seriousness of the sins of false teachers. He elaborates on these. He unpacks them. Again, I just want to warn you, Peter's very graphic in many ways here as well. Uh, Peter, when he writes this, he is furious. We see that. He is furious with evil. He should be, and we should be too. He is furious at what the false teachers are trying to do to devastate the sheep of the church. So he's leaving his readers no doubt as to what is happening. He's like, beware of the seduction of false teachers, the severity of false teachers, and how serious this is, right? So again, it is right for us today, church here, Orangeville, those in overflow listening right now, whoever, again, is listening, whatever it means and form right now, this is very serious, uh, and it must be seen and received as such. In some ways, we wish it wasn't, but it is. Uh, lives are at stake Again, uh, Satan is trying to destroy as many people as possible, and the main ways he does that is through the method of false teachers. So let's just understand who the false teachers are according to our text today. We have three sub-points beside me and behind me here on the screen. False teachers, number one, A, they are grossly irreverent. They are grossly irreverent. 
Uh, verse 10 teaches us these false teachers were extraordinarily arrogant. Uh, they were filled with self-exaltation. They loved themselves. The text says they were bold and willful there in verse 10. And notice it says this, bold and willful. And then verse 10 says, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. Now, what does that mean? Now, the interpretation here of glorious ones is admittedly difficult. Uh, most scholars agree it is referring to evil angels. Now, that is because in verse 11, we see the introduction of angels, of good angels. It says in verse 11, whereas angels who are described as being stronger and more powerful of the angels or the glorious ones just mentioned in verse 10. Uh, another translation for glorious ones could be celestial beings. And the reason that is important for clarification is because all beings were originally created by God. And so they were originally created by God, celestial beings, hence called here, we believe, uh, glorious ones. I think the strongest evidence here, though, that these are referring to actually evil angels and the extraordinary arrogance of the false teachers is coming from a similar text in the book of Jude, the letter of Jude, verses 8 and 9. Again, when you're in Scripture, we interpret Scripture with Scripture. We don't isolate one text all by itself. We want to gain further meaning interpretation. We use other portions of the Scripture. Look at how similar this passage is and the verses that come after this to our text today in 2 Peter chapter 2. But we get more detail here. Uh, yet in like manner, these people, false teachers, also relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme, there's this phrase, and blaspheme the glorious ones. But notice, but when the archangel Michael, good angel, contending with the devil, obviously evil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment. The archangel Michael said, that's, that's the Lord you do. The Lord rebuke you. The Lord will take care of that. Again, very striking, similar, almost exact phrases. And in some cases, we do have exact phrases from a passage here right now, right? We are learning here, we are learning here explicitly the contrast between good angels and evil angels. And the archangel Michael was unwilling to slander in this regard against the evil angels, leaving that to the Lord. But the point that Peter is making here in our text, the false teachers here represented, again, from his words, are so arrogant, are so rebellious, and so irreverent, they are willing to slander and blaspheme anything and anyone. We see in these false teachers, there is no fear of God at all. Zero. They do whatever they want. They say whatever they want. They show sin in whatever way they want as well. They are tremendously arrogant, lacking any hint or sense of reverence at all. One of the greatest concerns for our nation in recent times has been the same thing. Um, a disappearing of any reverence or fear of God whatsoever. It's one of the signs of our society that should concern us the most. Uh, the irreverence, the lack of any sense of, again, fear of God. God is mocked. Christ is just spat on again and again, reviled. Uh, such a growing anti-Christ flavor um, all around us all the time. It's, a, it's incredible the boldness and the arrogance and the blasphemous nature of so many people who have no idea ultimately what they're doing. That's a sign of, again, the same things that are happening in 2 Peter chapter 2 that are happening in our day here as well. You have people that have false teaching all around them. They are blaspheming God. They are filled with evil and they don't care. They just don't care. But God cares. So we see false teachers here. They are grossly irreverent. Next we see this, point 1B. They are destructively irrational and ignorant. Look at verse 12 now. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant. Again, they don't know what they're talking about. They will also be destroyed in their destruction. These are not my words, this is God's word. 
suffering wrong as they wage for their wrongdoing. They count up pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. So Peter continues here in his graphic description of the false teachers. Uh, he, he compares them to animals who are irrational, ignorant, and destined for destruction, right? So again, wow, wow. I'm just reading to you what God's word says. Hey, and by the way, loved ones here today, listen, like, like look at how this is not a game. Life is not a game. What's being described here is not a game. Uh, a heaven and hell in the balance. Eternal life, eternal death in the balance, uh, good versus evil all around us. It's, it's not a game. We have to use this lens, again, as we're living, that we take on the sobriety and see the severity and the seriousness to help us live with sober-mindedness and to pray, again, with fervency, to be vigilant and alert and to know every day we see what's actually at stake. This is why Peter is not holding back here. It's important for us. Again, it's difficult, but it's necessary. These false teachers, they display such confidence and arrogance, but they are clueless and oblivious. Um, they boast of understanding. They boast that they know truth and that they know life. But the Bible tells us their destination is certain death. It's interesting that Peter says in verse 13, he says, they are blots and blemishes. What's so interesting about that is in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14, the exact antonyms are used for believers in Jesus Christ. That in light of the return of Christ, we are to be spotless and blameless. The exact opposite of the character of the false teachers that are blots and blemishes here in chapter 2, again, verse 13. The false teachers, they revel in temporal sinful pleasure. They just love sin. Yet this will result in eternal suffering and destruction. Notice also in verse 13, they are so bold, they are so arrogant, they are so irreverent. Most crime or sin, people will wait for darkness. Not these guys. They revel in their sin in the daytime, the text says here in verse 13. They, they don't care. They are so blasphemous. They parade their sin for all to see. There is no sense of a hint of the fear of God or even of shame. So they're out there in the daytime in grotesque fashion with their obsession again with sinful pleasure. These false teachers, they mock the Christian biblical morality. They, they, they mock the design of God with sexuality. Uh, that, that's a massive theme here in chapter 2 as well. We need to take very strong notice of that. They act as though they have all the answers. They've, 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 they've figured out the truth. Uh, they redefine what is good. But the Bible is very clear here. They are ignorant. They are fools. They have no idea of that which they speak of. Uh, they are people who brutalize scripture. They rip out pages they don't like from the Bible. They pontificate things they're not even aware of. And yet we find that they are in utter error in the things that they speak of. A very serious warning that Peter has given, obviously here in chapter 2 with great detail. It's interesting to me that when you look at the history of mainline churches here in Canada in the last several years... Uh, the number one thing on their agenda is a passion for the sexual revolution. It's amazing to me of how much the obsession with the sexual revolution, the freedom to do whatever they seem fit, is really the driving agenda of so many of these churches that it's caused them to essentially be let off the cliff into apostasy. Yes, it started with the, we talked about this, it started with the denial of the authority of God's word. They have closed the Bible. They don't deem it as truth or whatever. But it's amazing to me how much, again, in that movement, they are just obsessed with the sexual revolution. The Bible tells us then because of that, they are headed towards a path of destruction because anyone who lives, again, obsessed with sexual sin, they cannot inherit the kingdom of God, the Bible says. It's serious, it's, it's, it's sobering, but it is reality. It's what we're learning in seriousness here today. We see the false teachers, thirdly, they are in, have an insatiable appetite for sin. Look at, look at verse 14, they have eyes full of adultery, 
insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed. Again, Peter almost, he just can't take it anymore. He just says, he cursed, a cursed children, exclamation mark, notice. These false teachers, they have eyes full of adultery. That, that means every woman they encounter is a wanted object of their lust. Eyes full of adultery. By the way, church, um, I just want to remind you again, the utter devastation that comes from sexual sin. There is something that is so massively serious and grievous to God and devastating in our lives in terms of sexual sin. The seriousness with which the Bible speaks on this subject how many lives are utterly decimated with the lustful longing for sexual and sensual satisfaction. We need to hear and we need to see that at the heart of these false teachers was an obsession with self-pleasure, specifically in sinful sexual pursuits. That should sober you and me pretty quickly. This is our world. It is everywhere. We don't even blush at it anymore. This is the problem. This is what we're being warned on. And you're here right now and you're here overflow or Orangeville, whatever you are. And this is again, filling your mind and heart. Receive it for what it is, a warning from God himself. Do not trifle. You profess to be a Christ follower. You have been bought with a price. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. You are to live your life in holiness and honor God with your body. I mean, we do not join ourselves to prostitutes and bail. We have to understand how God sees, and we'll see more of this as we go along today, a very, very severe and strict warning, specifically against sexual sin. False teachers could care less. They love it. They revel in it. They want more of it. And listen, they, the text says, they entice unsteady souls to grab more people to join in their parading, again, of such sinful pursuits. It says they entice unsteady souls. Why, why enticing unsteady souls? Why not why not enticing steady souls as opposed to unsteady souls? Well, because it's the unsteady soul that is most vulnerable. False teachers don't pray in the strong, they pray in the weak. They don't pray in the mature, they pray in the immature. They don't pray in the stable, they pray on the unstable. Because false teachers know that they can get a person who's immature and weak and vulnerable, they're very susceptible again to believing what is not true. Think about how many people over the years have been lured into cults. They've been lured into cults by false teachers because they have not been strong and mature in the word of God. They do not know better or they are ignorant completely. You think of false teachers entice them, they they prey on them. This is what the Bible says. They are wolves in sheep's clothing. We have to grow into sermon and wisdom because they come up and they, they have dressed the part. They have dressed themselves as a sheep. They know phrases to say. They can say something that sounds true, but in the end, if we really look into it, then they are absolutely leading with destruction. But in the appearance, if you don't know anybody, oh, yeah, it looks good, sounds good, feels good, let's go. And the false teachers are licking their chops and rubbing their hands in delight that another victim has come under their care. This is why 2 Peter 1 verse 12, maybe you can just glance over my Bible's open to the same page. In 2 Peter 1 verse 12, he says, you are to be established in the truth. Established in the truth. Because when you are established in the truth, you are stable in the truth, you are mature in the truth. When you are mature in the truth, you have wisdom. You have wisdom, you have discernment. You have discernment, you can distinguish between evil and good. You distinguish between evil and good, you're able to be protected and anchored in the faith, again, in Jesus Christ, and be able to move forward again with strength, wisdom, and protection. This is why, hey, listen, loved ones, again, you have one life to live. You must grow in the, in the truth. You must continue to increase in maturity in Jesus Christ. There's too much at stake. There's too much at stake. We are doing our best as a church, and you must join us in this process to grow on your own and with each other for wisdom, discernment, maturity, protection, blessing. The false teachers are everywhere. We read in verse 14, they have hearts trained in greed. 
um, the word train there is the same word used for like a super high level athlete training themselves for competition. The effort, the discipline, the concentration, the sacrifice of training again as a, an elite athlete for a competition. These false teachers put the same effort in training themselves in greed. They have a longing and a lust for more money, more power, more sexual pleasure, more of self. They systematically exploit others. Why? Why do they exploit others? To feed their insatiable appetite for sin. That's why they do it. They abuse and exploit others because they just want to feed their longing and hunger for sin. And so by the end of verse 14, Peter can't take it anymore. He just says, accursed children, accursed children, again, in the original exclamation mark. Peter, P- Peter's not cursing them. He is stating they are under the curse of God. They are under the curse of God because of the way that they are living and the deception that they are forwarding. The Apostle Paul is also very clear. Scripture, again, agrees with Scripture. In Philippians chapter 3, he says this. He says, for many... False teachers of whom I've often told you now with tears, look at, look at Paul's brokenness over this reality, walk as enemies of the cross. How does he describe those who walk as enemies of the cross? Their end is destruction, their God is their belly. And they glory in their shame. See, it's just complete irreverence, grossly irreverent, with minds obsessed with earthly things and earthly pleasure. This describes those who are walking the path of destruction and false teachers. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. It's just, it's, just the, it's, it's just the lust for the things of the world. They glory in what God calls shameful. And they are absolutely obsessed again with earthly things. And in the end, these false teachers, they are described their way as like Balaam. Balaam was the pagan prophet, the pagan prophet who took money that he might put a curse on Israel and that kind of interestingly bizarre text in the book of Numbers. But Balaam here is used in a very negative example. He was lost. He was astray. He was corrupt. I want you to notice here too that at the end of verse 16, it says that a a speechless donkey spoke with a human voice to Balaam. Notice, to restrain the prophet's madness. Madness there means what we think it means. It means really insanity. Insanity. I found that to be an interesting ad right here at the end of verse 16. False teachers are moving towards, moving forward with madness. I think about that a lot. I wonder if you do too. Currently in our society right now, we are reaching forms of madness this, this, this nation has never seen. And that is accurate to say. And I, and I say that with a hugely heavy heart and great discouragement to my own soul. Like there's just things happening where I'm just looking. I said, that's insane. Um, I believe this is accurate to say that we are the first generation in the history of the world that is unable to define what a woman is. And that's not funny. That's devastating. That is devastating. And that is madness. We now have come to say things out loud that no, as far as I understand, there's no generation in the history of the world that has ever said such things with a straight face. But when you reject God wholesale and when you reject his truth and when you reject everything he's about, you're left to yourself. And when you're left to yourself, you're left with a progress towards madness. God help us. Like for real, God help us. You know, and I say that too, man. This is heavy for me today for sure and it should be for you as well. But on on the other side of that, I'll also say this, that God is leading me personally right now in a season, weeks or months um, with a desire and opportunity to share my faith more than ever, um, meeting people on, on, a, on, a, on a regular basis, answering prayer. And I have to admit, many times, again, I'm fearful or I, I'm, I'm intimidated or I'm, I'm tired. But even, like, even this past week, I walked into the dentist. And, and I, I kid you not, I was seeking to try to have an opportunity to share my faith while like, working on my mouth. It was very awkward, very awkward. <laughs> But in the end, breaks here and there, and an amazing opportunity to, again, have a, have a, have a witness with the hygienist who's from Iran, a Muslim background. And at the end of that, and just able to, and it was just like, I was just like, you know, walk in, no expectation, you know, all the reasons not to. But there's people out there who are searching, people out there who need to love. And I just need to tell you, too, like the Advent season, right, God was on a mission. God is on a mission to send his son. He sent his son into a lost and dying world. 
on a mission to seek and save the lost. We are now his children. We are now on a mission with God. Wherever you are, whoever you are, God is sending you on a mission to the world that you live in. Where you work, where you live, your friends and family, whatever it, like, it might be, the teams that you're a part of, the hobbies that you do, you're on a mission. You have the gospel of Jesus Christ, as do I. And I want you to embrace that. As much as we stand for truth, we stand for truth and love. As much as we will not compromise on what the Bible says, we want to be agents of grace and light and love and purpose and mercy and compassion to those around us. Uh, the sheep are without a shepherd. Uh, they are scattered, they are lost, they are confused. Uh, we have compassion on them. We point them to the truth of Jesus Christ and we love them the best we can. And in our rejection, sometimes yes, but then we come across people again who need to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Loved ones, hear that, hear that right now. You are where you are in purpose and you are called with me to be on mission for the Lord Jesus Christ as a testimony, a light for the gospel in the time that we have because in the darkness, the light shines. And the darkness may shine, but the darkness will not overcome the light. And this is what we understand. These are grievous times, but these are times when the Lord is also working very powerfully. And he wants to use you. And he wants to use me in the process. False teachers, they revel in wickedness and wrongdoing. Number two, they promise freedom, but deliver slavery. This is the essence of false teaching. They make such promises of freedom, but they deliver in the end slavery. Look at verse 17. These are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. Wow. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. Again, wow. What a serious passage. The false teachers are described like a waterless spring. Uh, so just imagine you're in a desert. You're in a desert. You're dying of thirst. You're so, so thirsty. And you see what appears to be a well. And you run to the well. And your heart's being filled with anticipation and the exhilaration of being able to get a couple of drops of water on your desperately thirsty tongue. You get to that well and you only to find out to your dismay it is bone dry. It promises so much it delivers nothing. That's who false teachers are. They make all these promises, again, of life and living and fulfillment and satisfaction, but in the end, they are a waterless spring. False teachers are also like mists, the Bible says here. That means they are hollow, unstable. Uh, they result in disillusion. And, uh, an example of this today, think of the grotesque nature of the prosperity gospel false teachers. They promise health and they promise wealth and they promise riches and all for their own gain. Meanwhile, people are being destroyed in their pursuit of that which the Bible does not teach. It's a wickedness. It's false teaching. And Peter once again confirms this, the eternal judgment that awaits such people. He says, for them the gloom of darkness has been reserved. Hebrews 10 says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. False teachers, they just love to talk. They just never seem to stop talking. They blab their mouths over and over again. But in the end, the text tells us today their words are loud boasts of folly. It's interesting, eh? The word for speech there in that verse of verse 18, loud boasts, it's the same word used for the donkey speech in verse 16. And so the Bible is telling us here, the donkey has better doctrine than false teachers. Much better doctrine than the false teachers. False teachers, what do they do? They, they bait young converts. They seek to prey on those who are new in the faith. With what? With sensual, quote from the text, sensual passions of the flesh. What is that? That includes licentiousness sensuality, a pleasure-obsessed lifestyle, sexual promiscuity, gluttony, and drunkenness all come under sensual passions of the flesh. So when Satan sees a potential convert or sees a, a genuine seeker in Christ, what does Satan do? He quickly mobilizes his demons to try to snatch that seed, to pollute that mind, to sabotage their sincerity. And he uses false teachers again and again and again. And then we come to verse 19, which in many ways summarizes our entire day today, or at least our passage. It says, verse 19, they promise freedom. This should be underlined, highlighted. I have two exclamation marks in red pen beside it. They promise freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. 
for whatever overcomes a person to that he is enslaved. This verse right here, I think, summarizes the entirety of our society today. They promise freedom, but they themselves are slaves, are slaves of corruption. I thought this week, I thought, what are the, what are some of the biggest lies that we're facing today? Let's put the first one up here. We can do that. Here's one of the biggest lies we, we face today is this. Sexual liberation is the path of freedom. The world says if it feels good, do it. doesn't matter where, who, what. If it feels good, it's all about you, man. Specifically in sexual liberation. You, the world says you pursue whatever you feel like doing. And in the end, that'll be your satisfaction. That'll be your purpose and that'll be your freedom. What a lie from the pit of hell. Um, need, need to say this too. It's important in the day that we live. It's amazing as the generations go by, even from a couple ago, our culture was way, way, way more understanding of some kind of consciousness of sin. Listen, if you, if you are engaged in sex before marriage, you are currently engaged in sin. Young people, any people, couples, like you need to hear this. You try to rationalize and you try to make excuses, whatever it is. Sex is absolutely beautiful under the design of God. It is designed for a man and a woman in marriage. I'll say it again. If you are currently engaged in sexual practice outside of marriage, you are currently engaged in sin that is very sinful and very serious to God himself. If you are living together before marriage, you are living in sin. Marriage is reserved, again, and designed to be couples that are married under God, together. Let the marriage bed, Hebrews says, be undefiled. The marriage bed. I need to say these things out loud because there's so many, so many here that are not doing this. Like You, you have to hear the heart of God behind this too. The seriousness with which God sees, again, the purity of our lives. And the world says this, the Bible says this. First Thessalonians, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. What a statement, eh? Hey, what's the will of God? What's the will of God? Where shall I live? How about this? The will of God is your, is your purity, your sanctification, specifically in the context that you abstain from sexual immorality. This is pretty clear to me right now. This is pretty clear. That each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. Not in the passions of lust, which is our entire world, like the Gentiles who do not know God. Brothers, sisters, believers in Christ, we must be different. We must be different. And to treat it with the honor that God deserves. And the seriousness with which this is in our lives. This is a lie. It does not bring freedom. It brings devastation over and over again. Let's go to the next slide. The world says this, you can be any gender you desire. Freedom is found by denying your biological reality. The Bible says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. This is freedom. This is truth and this is purpose. What our world doesn't tell you, what our world doesn't tell you along with this lie up here, is that young people who go through gender transitions are 19 times more likely to commit suicide in their life. The level of devastation and regret and loneliness and despair, the world doesn't tell you that part. They're promising freedom. They deliver slavery. There's another lie. The world says, live your truth. You get to decide what is truth, which is a statement of madness in and of itself. How can that possibly be true? Jesus says, I am the way and I am the truth. And I am the life. No one comes to the Father. No one gets to heaven but through me, Jesus says. Live your truth. What is truth? Pilate said to Jesus. Jesus is truth. Jesus is life. Jesus is salvation. Jesus is hope. Jesus is forgiveness. Jesus is mercy. Jesus is salvation. Jesus, Jesus is victory over death. Jesus is entrance into eternal life. 
Jesus is everything. Jesus is the truth. And Jesus offers forgiveness and eternal life for whoever ever approach him by faith today and believe that he's the savior of their sins. You want freedom? You find freedom in Jesus Christ alone. Amen. Last lie, last lie. You can clap for that, it's great, amen. I'll clap for Jesus always. Satisfaction is found in putting self first. This is essentially our world everywhere. Every, everything we see, every message we receive, it's about you, you're it, self-pleasure, self-indulgence, self-satisfaction, self-worship. I mean, make sure you call it what it is. Self-worship. Self-worship. The world says this, Jesus says this. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. It's not putting self first, it's putting self last. This is the purpose and joy and meaning of life. To Jesus came, I did not come to be served, but I came to serve. The essence of what it means to follow him. This is the truth right here. False teachers do not tell us the truth. False teachers promise us freedom. This is the problem. They promise us freedom. This is your fulfillment. This is your answer. This is your life. This is who you are. Be all that you need to be and believe in yourself, blah, 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 blah. In the end, they promise all these things. But they, listen, this is so important. They themselves are slaves of corruption. So remember, all these people making these promises, just look closely at their lives. They do not have the things they speak of. They can't. They are shouting freedom behind a prison cell of death. That's what we need to see. They promise freedom. They deliver slavery. We must, we must be discerning. Young people, all of, all of us, young people, you must, you must grow in the wisdom of Jesus Christ to be able to see what is true and what is not. It is hard. I know, I know. It is hard, but it is possible. And again, in everything we do, we seek to love and shine light and humble ourselves and be grace, but not, not at the expense of truth. The failure to tell someone the truth is a failure to love them. False teachers, number three, this leads us to our third and final point. False teachers, their end will correspond with their deeds. Their end will correspond with their deeds. Look at verse 20. Verse 20 says, For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. Notice, the last state has become worse for them than the first regarding the false teachers. Verse 21, for it had been better for them to never have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. Verse 22, what the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit and the sow after washing, the pig after washing herself returns to wallow in the mire, the muck, or the mud. What's happening here? Peter is continuing to address the state of false teachers. He indicates that the false teachers, listen carefully, the false teachers had a knowledge of Christ and a knowledge of the way. So in that sense, you can say they were orthodox. What do you mean by that though, Robbie? In the sense of orthodox, they had a head knowledge of the truth. But a head knowledge of the truth is not the same as having a heart knowledge of the truth. The head and the heart must be engaged both in order for genuine salvation to take place. What's happening here, and this has been true of people all the way from Jesus' time in the Pharisees to the time of our day today. Just because someone has knowledge doesn't mean they're saved. Just because someone can say the right sentence doesn't mean they're following Christ. Just because someone can articulate and look the part doesn't mean it's genuine. The knowledge can remain superficial because it has not actually penetrated the heart. The Bible teaches us this over and over and over again. The Bible teaches us that people can learn to say the right. People can profess to know Christ and again, act a certain way. How do we know ultimately genuine salvation? 
How do we know? As the Bible says, the ultimate sign of genuine salvation in Jesus Christ is perseverance. It is the perseverance of the saints. When Jesus Christ saves someone, they will never lose their salvation. They will carry on to completion, Philippians 1, verse 6. What God has started, he will finish. Amen? When Jesus Christ begins salvation in someone, he carries it on to the end. The parable of the sower. I mean, that's a very sobering uh, parable right there. One, in, in this sense, one quarter of the seed's legit. The seed on the rock and the weeds and the thorns, not legit. Even some initially receive a joy and the account of the lights of the world of persecution, they fall away. Very mindful of this. People can say the right, but the greatest test, and sometimes it takes a little while, will be actual perseverance. So what's sobering here with the false teachers, they had an exposure to such truth. They knew the way in that sense in their heads. But in the end, when the choice came to the treasures of Christ or the trash of sin, they chose the trash of sin over the treasure of Christ. And they just revealed the evil reality and wickedness of their hearts. They wanted the pleasure of sin and self-destruction more than they wanted the treasure and salvation of Jesus Christ. And in that sense, they are more accountable than the person who never knew anything at all. Because they had knowledge of the way and they rejected Jesus Christ. That's why Peter says the last state has become worse for them than the first. It was better for them if they never knew anything at all. And that's why Peter quotes that proverb. They are like dogs that have returned to their own vomit. They are like pigs after washing have returned to wallow in the mud. So we learn this about false teachers. Their end will correspond with their deeds. Just in case you need a little more help with this, 1 John 2.19 is very helpful here too. 1 John 2.19 says they, they, those who are false, they went out from us, they looked apart, but they were not of us. Why? For had they have not been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are not of us. As only John can write in ways that sometimes are confusing and hard to read and follow. Don't you agree, whatever? But again, we see this here, right? They went out from us, but they were not of us. Because if they were of us, they would continue with us. But they did not continue with us, which indicated to us they are not of us and not from us. They are false. I trust that made sense. But the seriousness here, false teachers, false teachers, they revel, they revel in wickedness. False teachers promise freedom, but they deliver slavery. And false teachers are doomed to destruction. Again, remember, when Peter writes this, he's furious. He's furious with evil, and he should be. He is super protective over the sheep of God's flock, and he should be. And so Peter gives graphic warning and details as to the threat that the church is under. So what do we do ultimately? Well, number one, receive the warning. Receive the warning today for what it is, right from God's word, by the Holy Spirit. Watch, watchfulness, watch, be vigilant. Everywhere we go, watch on a daily basis. Stay awake, be alert, watch. Grow in wisdom, wisdom. Wisdom is such a weapon against evil. Wisdom, maturity, wisdom. Lastly, worship Jesus Christ. Worship Jesus Christ. You know, for those of us who've been tempted with sin, listen, Matt, Papa said, I love this. I've always loved this. We worship our way into sin. We worship self into sin. And we worship our way out of sin. We worship Jesus Christ. And when our love is for him, then everything else around us will start to come into perspective. So big deal today. God help us today. In Jesus' name, amen, church. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, I I do pray you will help us be prepared now to receive the Lord's Supper in a very special way in our worship of Jesus Christ and the truth that he is. Yes, Lord, would you be protecting this church and providing for this church and growing us, Lord, I pray that we men, women, and children, we love the truth, but we want to be used in love. We want to be used in grace. We love people enough, Lord, to seek to tell them the truth again of the lies of this world, but to show them compassion and love and mercy and grace with our lives on a daily basis. Lord, may it be so. Lead us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.